out that all the problems or diseases they have very similar signs. So it's a theme going on there. You ought to appreciate that because that helps you reduce the amount of stuff you got to memorize. The big you got to pick out the big hallmark signs though. What sets this respiratory disease against this respiratory disease, or this respiratory complication versus this one? Okay, so pick out the red flags. So any surgery can become infected. Um, it's largely dependent on the condition of the wound at the time of surgery, the degree of damage, the extent of dissection, manipulation, and length of the surgery. Okay. We aim not to have infected incisions. Giving them antibiotics after the fact is not going to really prevent you from having an infection. What prevents you from having an infection is general tissue handling skills, doing the minimal amount of dissection that's needed, and using appropriate technique. Okay? Some cases we do give them antibiotics during surgery, mostly orthopedic cases. And that's so that we don't accidentally pull some skin bacteria into the orthopedic situation that we're dealing with. Usually we're putting in implants and causing an infection there. That's why we use sefazolin. It's good for skin bacteria. All right. Other factors, as we've discovered before, age, other diseases, the presence of infection already in the body if they're already septic. So pyometras, they have a problem of getting infected. Um, cushionoid dogs have a problem of getting infected because their immune system's blunted. And older dogs just don't, or cats, just don't heal as well and have a tendency to get infected. Now here's your classifications. You've heard them before. Clean, clean contaminated, contaminated and dirty. And there's their description. I'm going to have to hammer it out and read it to you. Okay. A typical incision infection rate for most folks, most places, is about 1.6% in clean procedures. And these are in dogs not receiving antibiotics and using experienced surgeons and with a surgery less than one and a half hours. So as you have longer surgeries, as you have lesser experienced surgeons, um, the, that rate's going to go up. Okay, eight percent in, in surgeries lasting longer than one point five hours. There's several reasons why we surgeons don't like to be in surgery a long time. This is one of them. The other one is the longer you're in surgery, the greater the risk of anesthetic death. Okay. So your signs for an infection, you can have discharge that can be serious anguinous to purulent. You have tenderness. Erythema, which is redness, pain, or discomfort, plus or minus fever. Most cases, a sterile inflammation resolves within 48 hours. So if I give you three days out, you should think infection, not inflammation. Okay? 48 hours, that's two days. If it pops up on the third day, think infection. Sounds like a test question, doesn't it? Hint, hint, hint. Yeah, I do have a test question like that. Okay, you treat it by drainage, getting the culture and sensitivity real, is really good. You're going to debride it, drain it, give wound care if you need to. You may have to do wet to dry so you get a healthy wound and then closure. Remember this for next year, okay? If junior surgery continues like it has been, you will have dogs that will be post-op for a week between recovery and terminal. If we change it, you won't. Okay, these dogs will probably be gone before they show signs of infection. Yes. Just to clarify in my head, um, you were saying eight percent chance higher of infection for surgeries that last longer than one point five hours, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And also, you were saying that if you see the serous sanguinous to purulent discharge, tenderness, erythema, pain, and discomfort, plus or minus fever at three days, it's not inflammation; it's probably infection. Right. Okay. So you can have inflammation just from making an incision and suturing it close. The body's going to react to that. You've got that arachidonic cascade happening. There's a reason why we give NSAIDs. Um, usually you don't have a discharge with that. It's usually red, swollen, tender, maybe a little bit warm, 
but it's not screamingly painful and have a lot of discharge. So if I gave you, you have a red, swollen, painful incision three days out, I would expect you to think infection, not inflammation. So. Oh, let's see. Next. Okay, dehiscence. This could happen in any surgery, not just abdominal, okay? Your incision can come open. It's a breakdown in surgical wounds, usually secondary to another problem, or a technical failure in closure, which what happens in the abdominal wall. You don't close that rectus sheath and use proper knots and proper bites, you can have a dehiscence, and the next thing you know, you have intestines on the ground. Okay, because that sub-Q and that skin won't hold it. Will not hold it. Not for very long. Okay. You could also get dehiscence, say, of a non-cavity incision due to excessive tension. Say you took a large mammary mass off, and you didn't even bother the body wall, and you had tension on your closure, and it could come loose. Infection could cause a, de a, a dehiscence. Anything that causes delayed healing could cause a dehiscence. And of course, if you don't put an e-collar on them that's sufficient enough, or they get it off, self-mutilation can cause it. And then any condition that causes weak tissue. So once again, we're thinking diabetics and cushionoid dogs, old debilitated dogs, or cats. You start with serosagnomous discharge. Usually the swelling is not painful. You palpate, palpate deep uh, tissue disruption. You just, especially the body wall, you can feel the hole that that body wall is created by coming up. Um, then you have office, obvious dehiscence and evisceration where the intestines is laying on the floor. Treatment you want to close as soon as possible. Some uh, wounds you may have to treat as open wounds depending on the condition of the tissues, okay? Like I said, remember this for next year. Uh, I think we had two dehiscence this year. I lost track. Complications, any surgery? Does somebody have a question or somebody giggling? It's not a good thing that you lost track. Huh? Oh, I lost track? Uh, so you can have a seroma with any surgery, and that's usually because of a failure uh, to do one or two things together. Either good hemostasis and failure to close dead space. You can have good hemostasis and still have failure to close dead space and have a seroma, okay? But usually if you do both well, you're not going to have a seroma. The causes are inflammation, lymphatic injury, excessive tissue D decision, Dis dissection, excuse me, uh, traumatic surgical technique, poor closure, and constant motion at the surgical site. So anything that gets a lot of motion, you got to think really hard about getting a good closure on it. You can drain these um, and use compression bandages, or you can open them, drain them, and close them better. Okay. You want to take special care when you're doing surgery in the axilla and inguinal areas because those are typically prone to getting seromas because they're already kind of a, a space, okay? Sepsis, not common, but once you get it, it's hard to fix, okay? These guys usually circle the drain and die. Most common cases is prosthetic abscesses, pyometra, pyothorax, GI surgery where you have a dehiscence, or it was already contaminated before you went in. Hepatic or biliary surgery, renal abscesses, severe trauma, including comminuted and open fractures. When I was a resident, I had a cat that was uh, chewed up by another, I think it was a dog. It was a fat cat. And his fat was so traumatized that it became necrotic and we debrided it. He became septic from that. And he didn't have that much internal wounds, okay? So when you're lecturing owners about their fat animals, that's another thing you could tell them. Hey, if they get fat to this trauma, it can go to chronic and they can get septic and die. So it's good for them not to be fat. Uh, usually we don't rec recognize sepsis for a period of time after the surgery. You gotta watch them real close to find signs of it, okay? 
if they're not springing back after surgery like you expect them to look, okay, if they're just kind of, oh, I'm here, oh, I'm not really painful, but I just don't want to move, and I just kind of ADR, you may be having some sepsis going on. Uh, failure to progress, failure to get better as time goes on. Um, can, and you can uh, rapidly go into a septic shock and multiple organ failure with these guys. However, what you're going to do is check the CBC. You're going to have a leukocytosis, leukopenia, left shift, monocytosis, ch stop septic changes. If you've done an abdominal procedure, you might want to do a fast test twice a day. Just look for some free fluid in the abdomen. Okay? If you get some free fluid, tap it. Take a look at what's in there. Okay, that's an early sign of sepsis. Changes in your chemistries are going to be glucose, increasing alkaline phosphatase, low albumin, low platelets, fibrinogen, increased clotting time, and I imagine the lactate goes up too. You'll end up with a metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation, hyperkinesia due to this, um, or due to pulmonary thromboembolism or pneumonia if the sepsis came from there. Culture and sensitivity and extreme intensive therapy is what's needed to save these guys, and you're likely to lose them. Once they get septic, it's hard to pull them out of it. So going on, complications, any other surgery, other stuff, you can have hemorrhage, excessive blood loss, pain, you have problems with cosmesis, you didn't get a nice pretty closure, you might have management issues, you did an FHO on a 150 pound uh, mastiff and he's hard to get up and move around. Um, those rest down there I left for other experts, complications with blood products, complications with nutritional support, anesthetics, and eye, eyes and eyelid. If I went into everything, this could be a week-long course. Okay, so I'm just going to do surgical topics. So now, specific to particular surgical conditions or areas. Head and neck, okay? You, if you're on the head, you could actually enter into the cranial vault and cause brain trauma. Uh, if you enter into the sinuses or the trachea or the oropharynx, you can have subcutaneous emphysema. Okay, keep in mind, when you intubate cats and rabbits, just intubating and inflating that cuff, you could rip the trachea and get sub-Q emphysema. All right, it might not be head and neck surgery, but you could see it. You can have aspiration pneumonia, anorexia, mild collusions, and TMJ problems, if you, you know, depending on what you're doing with the jaw. Going back to aspiration pneumonia, that's the reason why we fast them the night before. Fast as far as food is concerned, usually we don't worry about water. But a lot of these animals have slow GI emptying. And I give hydro, and now recently people are going, well, let's give Serenia so they don't vomit. Actually, I like for them to vomit because I want to know if that stomach's truly empty or not. If they vomit up foam and vile, vile and no food, I know we're empty. Plus, it's even more empty. But a lot of times they'll vomit up food, and the students will go, well, they didn't fast them. I said, you don't know that. They may have slow GI transit. A lot of them do. So I don't know about the Serenia thing. Though. Yeah, I have uh, actually told them to go ahead and give it after they vomited. And then we just protect their airway really closely. A lot of times we'll pull it with their head down. Okay. Um, if we're doing dental or oral work where we have blood or junk in the mouth, we may partially deflate the tube and have their head down when we pull it so it'll drag anything out of the trachea that fell into the trachea. Because that that balloon's supposed to stop it, okay? But if you deflate it and pull it, you might leave it in the trachea, okay? We also look at the tube when we pull it. Is there gunk in the tube? What does it look like? You got persistent nasal discharge, sneezing, especially with uh, nose issues or nose surgeries. Recurrence of disease, okay, so anytime you're talking about the inflation, no matter where it is, recurrence of disease is potential complication, all right? You can have neurologic complications, for example, Horner syndrome, or facial nerve palsy, 
especially if you're working right up around the ear, in the neck. One dog I had that ended up with aspiration pneumonia post-op, she actually had a mild Horner syndrome, and what I did was a ventral slide on her. So I don't know, I've seen dogs with Horner syndrome that don't aspirate, so I don't know that those two were connected, but she aspirated like that, that night after surgery when they fed her. Because her tube was clear when we pulled it. Okay. You can end up with mucosils if you damage the salivary glands, oral nasal fistula, especially if you remove canine teeth. You can end up with oral nasal fistula or some of the bigger. Yes, ma'am. She was fed some food and obviously she some of it went down her windpipe. She was awake, she was up moving around. But you could still choke on your food. Y'all do it all the time. I know you do, because I do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but how is that a surgical that Well, because we just did surgery that day. So maybe she was awake enough to eat and walk around. But she didn't have a really good gag or cough mechanism left. Maybe she was a little numb from the tube being in there. Maybe it was because she was getting opioid drugs. We just don't know. The intern didn't notice her gagging, gagging or coughing, but when we discovered her having respiratory problems and we started suctioning her airway, we were getting food out. So she aspirated sometime between the time she ended up in, out of surgery to the time she started having respiratory problems. The week afterwards, Auburn had one too. So it wasn't just me. Okay. <laughs> you go in the, yes ma'am. So since we fast the animal from about 8 o'clock midnight the day before surgery and get them through surgery, usually they don't like wake up really well until maybe like 3, 4 o'clock depending on what time you got them out of surgery. Would you say feed them dinner, not necessarily feed them right when they get home because we know they're hungry, but... What I usually tell owners if I send them home the same day, about five hours after surgery, they can give them maybe a quarter of their normal meal. And that's what the intern did with this patient. If they keep it down, they don't have any problems eating and they keep it down, they can give in an hour another quarter of a meal. And they can keep doing that because one, they might be they might throw up because of drugs. Two, they might be nauseous and not want to eat. Three, if they're still drunk and they're having a hard time actually eating it, I don't think I'd feed them. So I want to see them drinking well first because it's harder to lap water than it is to eat food for a dog. So this is the first aspiration pneumonia I've ever had, other than one that came to me aspirated. I had one, they overdid acepromazine when they flew a dog, military working dog to Iraq and he aspirated and he came to me. We saved him, but it's hard. So surgery in the thoracic cavity, obviously there's a lot of big blood vessels there and there's a big bag of blood in there that moves called the heart. So you can have hemothorax. Obviously, if you're going into the chest, you're going to create a pneumothorax, or you can have a pneumomediastinum if you don't get it all out. Or if you leave a laceration in the lung, it could even you get it out, it re, re inflates. Um, stenosis of uh, the airway if you're dealing with the trachea, recurrent laryngeal damage, nerve damage, again, because it goes all the way down. Uh, hooks around one of the vessels. Y'all remember which one? Look it up. <laughs> you have pulmonary edema, okay? Even if you're not doing anything pulmonary-wise. You can have pulmonary edema after any surgery, okay? You have down lung that's atelectic for too long, you roll them over and you give them a good breath, you could cause pulmonary edema. Acute respiratory failure, cardiac arrhythmias, sub -Q emphysema, Chylothorax, because the thoracic duct comes down from the GI tract and dumps into one of the vessels, right? Comes right down around the heart. In fact, we sometimes go in at, in the chest and ligate it. 
You can have a lung lobe torsion. Next year when I talk to you about lung lobe torsion, I'm going to say a risk factor is previous thoracic surgery. Okay? You can end up with airway obstruction, mediastinal shift, or VQ mismatching. You can also end up with gastroesophageal reflux. That's very common after any kind of surgery, not just thoracic. Just because of the anesthesia, what it does with the uh, lower esophageal sphincter tone. You can end up with obstruction, pneumothorax, hydrothorax, chylothorax, hemothorax. I'm going to repeat myself here. Pulmonary reinflation edema. You can get that with thoracic surgery. You can get that with diaphragmatic surgery. Okay? There's something else. There's another one I teach y'all next year that, that you can get it from. And I can't remember off the top of my head at the moment. You can end up with a lack of domain in the abdomen if you have a diaphragmatic hernia and you've had the stomach sitting in the chest for a long time. So you put the stomach back where it goes, you get pulmonary edema in the lungs from re-expansion re and then you have a hard time closing the belly because the stomach's lived there for so long the abdomen shrunk. So that's what that means. Loss of domain. Sounds like a test question, doesn't it? Okay, cardiovascular system, obviously hemorrhage. So I'm not going to, you know, don't pick the hemorrhage one. You can get hemorrhage with any surgery, okay? You can get cardiac tamponade or arrhythmias. You can get cardiac herniation, especially if you're doing a pericardial at pericardectomy and you don't do it big enough. You get phrenic nerve damage, heart failure, left or right shunning, reoccurrence, failure to fix. You have uh, patch leakage. There's a lot of patching that's done in some cardiovascular surgeries. I have never done them. Y'all will never do them unless you become a fancy cardiac surgeon. They can leak. And then you have device issues. I have placed pacemakers. That's pretty cool. Okay, endocrine system. The endocrine